first of all, I wanna say thanks to all of you for being here and joining us tonight. Uh, my name is John Osp and I'm the gallery director for the RIT College of Art and Design. And that includes RIT City Art Space, which is located in the historic Sibley building at Liberty Pole Plaza in downtown Rochester, New York. We're currently hosting an installation of Untitled LA. It's a work of art by the late Felix Gonzalez Torres. And it's on view right now, and it uh, will be on view through February 21st of 2021. And this installation, you can sort of see it behind me uh, in my virtual background, is made up of thousands of pieces of individually wrapped green candies, and they're spilled neatly on the floor. And viewers are able to take a piece of this candy when visiting the space in person. So I encourage you uh, to visit City Art Space if you're in town. We're currently open to the public Thursday through Sunday, 1 to 5 p.m. Admission's always free, and so I hope you get a chance to visit the space and uh, encounter this work in person if you haven't already. Tonight is our last discussion in a series of online talks. Our first presentation was an introduction to Felix Gonzalez Torres and his works uh, that are known as Candy Spills. Um, and that's now accessible on our website. You can check that out at cityartspace.rat. Edu, if you missed it, along with the second talk we hosted, which was actually a panel discussion on World AIDS Day. It was sort of connecting the artist and his work with broader themes of historic and current AIDS awareness efforts. Tonight's talk is called From Exclusion to Inclusion, and we'll focus on some contemporary perspectives of his work, um, centered around how the artist, Felix Gonzalez Torres, both challenged and accepted the limits of contemporary art institutions. And we'll also talk about this work, you know, if it's still um, in a larger sense relevant today uh, in the wake of current events in the light of a global pandemic and um, wide social political unrest. And we have some special guests joining us to address that question in conversation and I'll introduce them in just a moment. We've also compiled some quotes from members of our extended community and we asked them if this piece is still relevant today. So we're gonna continue to compile those thoughts into a digital catalog, um, but we'll be sharing some of those in our conversation here as well. Before we get started though, I wanna take a second to give some thanks to important folks who've made this all possible. This work by Felix Gonzalez Torres is jo uh, jointly owned by Art Bridges and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And this project is made possible by the generous support of Art Bridges. Art Bridges loans works of art from its collection to museums and art spaces all across the country, allowing more audiences to see these important works, but also helping support educational programs like this one, sparking dialogue um, and igniting connectivity with its collection of art. So I want to say thanks very much to Art Bridges and the staff uh, for supporting our efforts here. I also want to thank Stephanie Rankin, Director of Foundation Relations at RIT, along with my colleague and collaborator, Julie Decker, Associate Professor and Director of the Museum Studies Program in the College of Liberal Arts at RIT. She's been instrumental in developing this project along with Stephanie Rankin um, and also the Associate of Programming, including tonight. Julie's joining us here as a co-host tonight and you're gonna hear from her shortly as well. Also wanna thank Erin Garland at the RIT College of Art and Design, whose support has helped make tonight possible. possible. And uh, finally, to the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation for their collaboration with us on this project. So with that, we're happy to have you with us tonight. And I'm really excited to introduce our contributors for this evening, starting with our live graphic artist, Kelly Kingman, who is passionate about helping people think and communicate more visually. She combines careers in publishing, design, digital content, graphic storytelling, and shows people how to harness the power of pictures and words to make messaging more engaging. As a graphic storyteller, Kelly captures and visualizes information in real time and teaches individuals how to use simple images to ideate, collaborate, and communicate more effectively. She specializes in simplifying and visualizing messages so they spread farther and faster in our increasingly image-driven social media landscape. And you can learn more about Kelly and her company, Kingman Inc. at kingmaninc.com. So, Kelly's gonna be visually rendering our conversation live uh, here as we go along. Um, our next guest I'm gonna introduce, Joshua is gonna uh, share his screen for his presentation. And then uh, after that, Kelly will be sharing her screen. So you'll see her live drawing come up shortly. And so Kelly, we're excited to have you with us tonight. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Our other special guest this evening is Dr. Joshua Chambers-Letson. Uh, 
who is a writer and professor of performance studies at Northwestern University. His books and essays place performance studies in conversation with a diverse set of fields, including Black studies, Asian American studies, art history, and critical theory. In his most recent book titled After the Party, A Manifesto for Queer of Color Life, published by NYU Press in 2018, Joshua tells the stories of queer and femme of color artists like Nina Simone, Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, Don Vo, and Felix Gonzalez Torres, among others, who all mobilize performance in the service of emancipation and survival. And we became familiar with Joshua's work uh, in an early essay that he wrote, which was called Contracting Justice, the Viral Strategy of Felix Gonzalez Torres. And Joshua starts this essay with a quote uh, from Felix Gonzalez Torres himself. And I just wanna read that quickly here. And uh, it's interesting because Felix Gonzalez Torres is describing the, his aesthetic and political strategy in the way he makes art. And so I think it hits directly on what we're talking about here. At this point, I do not wanna be outside the structures of power. I don't wanna be in the opposition or the alternative. No, I want to have power. I want to be like a virus that belongs to the institution. All the ideological apparatuses are, in other words, replicating themselves because that's the way culture works. So if I function as a virus, an imposter, an infiltrator, I'll always replicate myself together with those institutions. So that quote from the artist and, and Joshua's essay uh, really opened up this topic of exclusion and inclusion in Felix's work, both for the artist, but I think also for viewers, and specifically about whether this viral strategy that Joshua refers to remains effective after the artist's death and also in the face of recent and current events, including a global virus, pandemic, and social political unrest. So we're really thrilled to be joined by Joshua chambers Letson this evening, who's going to spend a few minutes and kick off the conversation. Joshua, thanks so much for being with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you also to uh, the Rochester Institute of Art um, for the invitation to be with you today, um, as well as to Julie uh, Kelly, um, our interpreters, Jen and Danny um, uh, and Courtney for the labor and care that it's taken to make today happen. Um, I also just wanna begin by acknowledging that the institutional space from which I speak, Northwestern University uh, and the land on which I stand in Chicago, is located on the unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, John brought our attention to a statement that Felix Gonzalez Torres made in a conversation with Joseph Kosuth in 1994. I won't read the whole thing, but effectively about being like a virus that belongs to the institution and that functions as a virus, an imposter, and an infiltrator in order to replicate himself uh, within those institutions. I cited that passage in a 2009 article, which was drawn from my then recently defended dissertation as I was preparing to begin my first job as a professor. I'm mixed race, uh, black and Japanese by my mother and white by my father, and I'm also queer. Uh, and I was keenly aware that I was joining an institution and a profession that was then as it is now, a majority white, majority straight, affluent, and often deeply patriarchal space that can be fundamentally hostile to the presence of Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous people, as well as femmes, queers, and trans folk. Um, I was hopeful that I could play a part in changing that, uh, and I was drawn to FGT's work precisely because it seemed to offer, offer a tactical strategy for doing so. Um, and just to sort of make it slightly easier uh, on the translators, I'm just gonna say FGT as a, a shorthand um, for his name. Um, so as I mentioned, I teach at Northwestern and the words diversity, inclusion, and equity um, is a phrase that we hear with nearly mechanical regularity on campus. Um, as a brilliant trans of color grad student recently remarked in uh, a class, uh, though diversity, equity, inclusion might just be PR for the university. Students know this to be palpably true. It's not uncommon for black doctoral students or other students of color in the humanities to be the only black person or one of very few in a graduate seminar. But when you walk into the offices of the university administration or open the website, as you can see a screen cap here, um, or uh, move into any university publications, you'll face a lot of the students of color on campus as well as faculty, making it look as if there are a lot less few, we are a lot less few and far between than we actually are. Now, my senior year of college um, at Eugene Lane College of the New School, 
uh, and this is in 1999. Uh, a group of students of color and I refused to let, I am just made myself younger than I am, older than I am, that was 2001. Um, a group of students of color and I refused to let the school's photographers capture us in protest of the use of our images. Um, and we were shocked to find when the recruitment materials were published and released later that year that they had populated the catalogs with glossy images of young people of color smiling and laughing on and around campus. But none of us recognized any of these faces because they were models that had been hired. Um, FGT's strategy of infiltration seemed to offer a way to smuggle queer of color life into spaces that were largely and continue to be hostile to black and brown queer life, such as the university or museum space. It happened uh, at the level um, uh, in the work of one of the firmest borders to be enforced in the United States, the body. And we can take the candy spills um, uh, as an example of this. Now the candy spills commonly referenced the bodies of FGT and his partner who were both infected with HIV. So you can see the spill in front of you um, is uh, in the collection of the Chicago Art Institute. And I believe that this piece is the ideal body weight or begins with the ideal body weight of Gonzalez Torres and his partner. Um, and then is wasted down as, as folks take the candy and eat them. Um, despite the profound and violent expressions of homophobia and racism towards HIV positive folks, as well as queer Latinx immigrants during the 80s and 90s, as well as today, FGT had white heterosexual couples on dates and tourist parents in the museum encouraging their children to place the candy in their mouth and suck on it. He literally uh, infiltrated their bodies, tricking the masses into experiencing, in his words, oral gratification, while sucking on a metaphor for queer brown flesh. He was making his work at a moment when the outrageously homophobic and anti-art members of the US Senate, like Senator Alphonse D'Amato of New York and Ted Stevens of Alaska, were using the spectacle of queer and bi POC art to carry out an assault on public arts funding. Rather than take a confrontational or oppositional stance to this setup, FGT set about infiltrating the dominant institutions and turning their apparatuses against themselves. I think one of the reasons that FGT has become something of a saint for so many queers of color who have followed in his wake is that his strategy actually worked. He did the impossible. In 1994, he received a solo show at the Smithsonian Institute's Hershorn Museum, just a stone's throw away from the phobic bubble of US Congress. He was a huge success in the market at a time when queer artists of color couldn't get a showing and most can still today barely pay their rent. And still in the work, one found a profoundly politically engaged discourse on queer and POC life, as well as a steady critique of the operations of neoliberalism, white supremacy, US empire and patriarchy. Uh, his work was what black feminist theorist Bell Hooks described as having a subversive beauty and staging a radical new mode of contestation. Those were her phrases um, in her 1994 essay for the Hirshhorn catalog. Now, part of the subversive beauty of FGT's work was its ability to pass under the radar. When Senator Stevens got wind that a gay Cuban immigrant was having a show at the Smithsonian, he announced that he would attend the opening as a kind of threat. The artist happily reflected I thought he's going to have a really hard time explaining to his constituency how pornographic and how homoerotic two clocks side by side are. He came there looking for dicks and asses. There was nothing like that. Now you try to see homoeroticism in that piece. Of course, it's not actually that hard to see homoeroticism in a piece that features a bunch of poles circling two holes. This is the point. He found a way to package queer love and queer erotics, dangle them in front of homophobes like the Senator and get away with it on their own turf. And part of the way he was able to do this was through a poetics of beauty that obscured what might be perceived as the more confrontational nature of queer brown difference as it entered into white spaces. The gambit worked and he got entry, but one might ask today at what cost? As Arlene Davila has recently written, the case of FGT, quote, may be the clearest example of how Latinidad is whitewashed when Latinx artists are inserted in, into the commercial art world. And that's the end of the quote. Most, if not all of the early criticism on FGT's work was perfectly comfortable underlining the significant place of sexuality and queerness in his practice, 
while anxiously and nervously, if not phobically and defensively, building a wall to keep out serious considerations of questions of race and ethnicity. This, despite the fact that the thematics of Latinidad, Cubanidad, and Blackness are variously addressed within the work with a fair amount of regularity. Uh, and he also discussed it regularly in his remarks and interviews, um, these themes. For closing intersectional analysis, dominant approaches suggested that FGT was more palatable to the art world as a white seeming or white passing gay artist than as a Latinx queer subject who was infiltrating the cultural institutions of white US American privilege and power. Many of the critics and curators who actively guided the unlikely work of the gay Cuban HIV positive refugee later living with and dying from AIDS into white box exhibition spaces and Tony art publications were often themselves white. Few to none of these interlocutors, critics and scholars had a history of engaging with and were thus not attuned to sensing the Latinx, Cuban, Cuban expat and otherwise brown content of the work. So much of the criticism of his work, for example, will completely cut out um, his years of training at the prestigious University of Puerto Rico, the work that he was doing at UPR, um, including the art historical engagement that he was making with, for example, um, the graphic tradition of um, uh, sort of decolonial artists in the 1950s in Puerto Rico. Um, when this early critical consensus established questions of race and ethnicity, if at all, they would usually point to the fact that the artist eschewed expected approaches to such matters before quickly pushing the problematics of race to the side. In the resulting years, the critical literature on Gonzalez Torres has had a shockingly segregated response as white critics and curators tend to underline FGT's critique of identity protocols in order to ignore and refuse all the many things he had to say about race and ethnicity while in turn, approaches to his work that give sustained critical attention to the question of race and ethnicity have been primarily um, explored by scholars and critics of color. Much of the burden of FGT's whitewashing is placed at the feet of his white patrons and even his estate, but I think the story is somewhat more complicated. Many of us, because we love FGT, have not placed pressure on his own role in the process, and also because we have understood the impossible position that he was in. In the United States, artists and intellectuals of color often gain recognition and inclusion within the institutions of the dominant culture, such as museums or universities, through an instrumentalizing process of collecting that is primarily meant to demonstrate a given institution's commitment to niche consumerist corporate values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. One understands why FGT wanted to avoid this trap. Artists of color may be curated together based on abstractions such as nation of origin or racial and ethnic affinity rather than the work's concerns. Such forms of multicultural inclusion may do little to address or even be contrary to disestablishing the structural conditions that maintain the museum, art space or university as phobically and sometimes dangerously and violently white spaces. But I still have to wonder if the oblique strategies that FGD affected to infiltrate these structures did not in some way reinforce the racial, sexual, and gender hierarchies that structure life within the institutions of the art world. After all, like myself, FGT was a light-skinned and racially ambiguous masculine-bodied person. He had a proximity to whiteness, including his much romanticized love affair with his white boo, Ross Laycock. He was often read as a man, and he was trained to speak in a master discourse and with the colonists master tongue in a way that made him palatable and even easy to include without the majoritarian sphere making any major concessions. As the artist Glenn Ligon observed in a piece of writing that is otherwise a love letter to FGT, during his lifetime, Felix was the artist of color whom curators and critics buzzed into the corridors of power while the angry torch and issue wielding others were told to go around to the service entrance or wait by the coat room. One small example of one of the strategies FGT affected to infiltrate a system that was hostile towards Lat Latinx life um, can be his tactical shirking of diacritical marks from his name when he was alive. So you'll notice in virtually all publications and promotional materials, um, the accents over the E and the A in his name uh, don't appear. Um, I have published on his work many times, and when working with the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation, authors are instructed to remove all diacritical accents from his name in order to secure image permissions. 
The terms that the gallery gives for the stipulation are conditional and based on the artist's own interests. Um, so when the foundation wrote to me that the artist, quote, intended and practiced for the diacritical marks to be used only within Spanish speaking contexts, I responded by pointing out that the United States is a, a Spanish speaking context. Um, the foundation refused this argument. Uh, so I made my peace with the removal of the remarks in previous publications by understanding it as respecting the wishes of a dead man that despite the feelings of intimacy I feel with his work and life story, I never actually knew. They would know better than me what he wanted. But I was left to wonder first, if I was simply participating in the artist's politically suspicious act of passing for white so as to be commercially palatable, or on a much more generous register, if the foundation and I were honoring a survival strategy that may have made sense and even been necessary for the artist in 1994, but has come to be positively reactionary in 2021. My initial rejoinder was correct, I believe. The United States is a Spanish speaking context. It always has been. Um, as many of my friends in some of the Southern border states will say, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Um, so the removal of diacritical marks from contemporary publications reproduces the kind of everyday violence that erases the long presence of Latinx life from within the country, normalizing the cultures of white majority rule down to the level of phonetics. This erasure is connected to a social logic that allows us to understand the indefinite and inhumane treatment of racialized black and Latinx migrants and their children, including their detention in cages at the border as acceptable since they are marked, not unlike the diacritical marks, as not of this context and thus not worthy of even the most basic ethical consideration. Indeed, the white supremacist order in which we live has never functioned along a logic of total exclusion. Cages are themselves a form of inclusion on which national identity is violently founded, as are the categories of exceptional privilege that may be extended to say a Cuban refugee as opposed to a dark skinned Guatemalan refugee or a light skinned gay man as opposed to a black trans femme. To put it bluntly, I think we have to reassess the success of the strategy of infiltration. If we thought his infiltration of an ascendance in the art world would make it any less possible that the art world would fail vulnerable populations during a pandemic, whose effects have been disproportionately distributed to the already vulnerable, as was the case in his lifetime, the events of the last year might give us pause as that very thing has happened in an even larger and more compressed form. I still often go to museums like the Museum of Contemporary Art or the Art Institute of Chicago to encounter FGT's work, since it is often proudly included and displayed in such major institutional collections. When I am in these buildings, I am palpably aware, as I am when I am on campus, that the majority of people in these institutions, from the patrons to the students to the donors and the faculty or the administrative staff are white, and that the majority of people of color who are there are included as staff to the service entrances, guarding the art or working the coat rooms and the restaurants. It was those very people, the racialized workers of color who keep the museums and universities alive, keep the art and facilities safe, and keep the patrons, students, faculty, and administrative staff taken care of. And they are usually the ones without savings who live from paycheck to paycheck. And they were the ones who were laid off, furloughed, and fired in the pandemic, many losing health benefits at the worst possible time. Just last month, Chicago's Museum of Contemporary Art laid off 11% of its staff, much of which was precarious and contingent black and brown labor. Northwestern University similarly furloughed much of its racialized and immigrant facilities and services staff as its majority white and well-off faculty and administration have weathered the storm safely in our homes or worse, they decamped uh, to winter homes, uh, I'm sorry, to summer homes in warmer places. I don't have one of those. Um, as such, I worry that an answer regarding the success of strat the strategy of infiltration will not come from someone like myself, nor even from someone like Felix. In the final instance, we uh, may simply have been used as models in the glossy catalogs and recruitment materials of the institutions that let us in the doors with no intention of ever actually changing. The answer as to the success of this strategy may instead come from the MCA and Northwestern workers who have lost their jobs, 
who don't know where the rent is going to come from and are lining up at the pantry just down the street from me to get some food for their kids or their parents or themselves, or who couldn't answer the question at all because COVID has already taken them from us. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. That, that's, um, there's a lot in there to talk about. The sort of visual uh, uh, rendering that's gonna be taking place live as we continue here. And it looks like uh, she's already got quite a bit completed here. So uh, we'll be digesting that visually as we contemplate what Joshua just uh, presented here. And then also some of the, the questions and quotes we're gonna get through. So I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, our co-host, Julie Decker who's been assembling some quotes uh, and working with those contributors. We're gonna just use these as talking points uh, as we move forward in our discussion here, but we're also gonna uh, open it up for, for questions, especially in response to what Joshua just said. But I'm gonna turn it over to Julie now to continue the discussion here. Julie, we received uh, you know, around a dozen quotes or so from a variety of contributors. So there's lots to talk about here. There is, John, thank you. Um, I guess I would, before I um, take our, or share some of the quotes out, um, I would just ask if anyone has a question immediately for Joshua after his presentation. So we do have one from Ketsia. So Ketsia's question for you, Joshua, is are there other artists that inspire you the same way in terms of queer and Latinx art? Yeah, that's a great question, right? I mean, I think actually, um, you know, the truth is, is like there's libraries and libraries full of artists. And I think a lot of the artists, um, for the exact reason that we're discussing, right, a lot of those names um, uh, weren't ushered into the corridors of power, right? And a lot of the artists, um, including queer Latinx artists that were working at the time um, that Felix was working, who didn't have the same kind of institutional imprimatur, right, are um, an older generation now, many of them didn't stay um, working in art because their work uh, wasn't sustainable. Um, uh, and others are still working, but, you know, can barely pay the rent, right? Um, uh, so the list is wide, um, but I think, you know, I'll talk about just right now and like the contemporary moment, um, you know, you have really extraordinary performance artists like Nao Bustamante, who sort of emerged out of the San Francisco performance scene um, in the 1980s and 90s, um, and has been a central figure in um, queer and Chicanx performance in Los Angeles, alongside a new generation of amazing um, uh, uh, artists and performers like uh, Dorian Wood and uh, Rafa Esparza, um, uh, uh, as well as Gabriela Ruiz, who also um, has the name Leather Poppy, right? Um, and I'm naming a lot of folks that tend to work in performance, which is sort of my area of specialization. Um, um, uh, uh, and actually now I'm just, start, I'm gonna have to not just start listing names, right? Cause I'm starting to also think of sort of like names of the moment, like jo Joey Terrell, who was a really important painter. Um, and I would say, so that I don't just keep rambling, rambling. Um, a catalog that I can really recommend folks to look um, for is the Axis Mundo catalog um, from an exhibition that was at the uh, at LACMA probably about three or four years ago um, on um, uh, the sort of currents of uh, queer um, Latinx um, and Chicanx um, art making uh, uh, largely in the sort of like 80s and 90s as well which included members of um, the OSCO collective, um, as well as um, uh, 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 folks like Taro, who I mentioned. So uh, I would check out the Access Mundo catalog, which is an amazing piece. I would also check out um, Mundos Alternos, which is a catalog um, that was, uh, I believe, edited by um, uh, Rob Hernandez, who was the curator of the show. It was a show at the um, uh, Art Museum at the University of Riverside, which was sort of thinking about um, speculative fictions and Latinx world making, but also engaged with a lot of really amazing um, um, artists that were also associated with, say, the Axis Mundo show, people like Mundo Mesa, et cetera. So that's those are just some names to, to look for, but I think in sort of giving you that list of names, you can also see that there is a huge body of work out there that itself can be obscured by how much attention has been paid to Felix's profoundly important work, right? But often at the expense of other artists that we might engage or think in relationship to the kinds of practices and cultural communities that he was working in and with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, so now I'm going to turn things over um, to the first of our sharers. Um, and just so everyone's aware, um, folks who are on um, 
the attendees uh, who did submit their commentaries in advance, um, all in terms of process, I'll enable your uh, audio, but not your video. So you don't have to worry if your hair's not combed or whatever. Um, and Courtney, who is a, one of our museum studies students, who's note-taking for us, when I say your name, she'll pop your comment into the chat. That way everyone um, who's attending has access to it. So the thinking is that um, we'll call on you so that you can either verbally read what's gonna be in the chat or you can kind of extrapolate from there. Um, so for context for everyone who's joining us, the context that we had given to our presenters and we're starting with Peter Gaybeck here in just a moment. The question that we asked them was how does Felix Gonzalez Torres's work Untitled LA, which you're seeing behind John and in the corner of Kelly's render, how does that work resonate today? And we sort of gave them the a word limit of sorts. So with that, I'm going to um, enable Peter's microphone so he can um, chime in with some comments and um, Courtney will uh, pop his quote into the chat. So Peter, the floor is, I think it's yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think you can all hear me now. I am one of those people who is unkempt and has a bad hair day right now. So, you know, what I would say as I was really looking at, you know, at this work and, and trying to, to see, you know, how it, it measures up, you know, today, almost, you know, three decades later, th there's a lot to, to really focus on. And I, I think much in the same way we've been talking about, you know, marginalized communities, particularly, you know, the LGBTQIA++ community and how it was silenced, um, you know, due to, the aid, due to the AIDS pandemic and to some extent is placated and silenced today still, although things are better, I think I, I look back on this work and I see um, how far we've come as a, a LGBTQIA++ community, and I do represent that community, but yet I also see how far we have uh, to go. And I'm not going to read uh, my quote. Folks can do that, you know, in the chat. Um, it's, it's just it's a magical piece that still holds up for all of the critical art historical reasons. As a, as a sort of a classically trained art historian, you know, there are, um, you know, sort of evocations of ancient Rome, uh, and it's just, I find it to be just a magically engaging piece and thank you for the time tonight. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, the, one of the words that you use, just to kind of um, connect with that, one of the words that you used in your phrasing um, is, let me find it, it's on my highlighted sheet. Um, <laughs> just one moment. Um, you have the word unwrapping a single jade cabochon with a crinkle. And I just thought the phrasing of that, the sort of delicate nature that you're sort of going into this very intentional act of taking and unwrapping and that it is ultimately this single jade cabochon, this single jade jewel in some ways. And so um, I, I really wanted to thank you for that comment and um, uh, thank you for being here with us. I think we'll um, turn over next um, to um, one of our colleagues, uh, Daniel Crawl, who has a perspective as um, a preparator at a museum nearby. And so I'm thinking we can um, hear from him on his commentary uh, in just a moment. I think he'll be joining us here in just a moment, says Daniel Crawl. Hello. Hi, Daniel. Hey, so yeah, like um, Julie said, I'm a preparator um, at the Egyptian Museum in Syracuse. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, Untitled LA is still resonating with people um, you know, three decades after it was created. Uh, kind of going off of what uh, Peter just said, actually, um, I think the queerness is a huge aspect, obviously. Particularly, there's, um, not to be morbid, but there seems to be almost an innate sense of loss and mourning that kind of comes with queer life, at least in uh, you know, the United States. Uh, I was born uh, in the middle of the AIDS uh, epidemic, so I didn't have the same kind of loss that uh, others around Felix Gonzalez Torres' time would, or even uh, Peter's time. Uh, but, you know, the loss of family, the loss of friends, whether it's through uh, homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia, or suicide, um, 
that's like kind of a, a just an innate sense of, of loss comes with kind of being a queer person. I, mean, I would say from personal experience, but there's also a sense of hope. There's a sense of kind of beauty and community uh, and belonging that can be found. I think the the inclusion exclusion aspect uh, that some people have spoken about is kind of critical there, just with the way that you know we may lose things or loved ones, whether it's through um, intentional rejection or death, but also we can find extra special connections, which are more critical in some ways than just a, a biological uh, you know, relationship or friendship. Um, and I think obviously just with the way that 2020 and 2021 have been going, um, you know, I didn't experience losing friends to uh, HIV or AIDS, but losing friends or family members uh, through COVID or just seeing people waste away for one way or another, whether it's mentally being stuck at home or not. I think that's why uh, another reason why the work just really resonates still. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, we were, John and I were commenting before we um, started the presentation tonight, um, just the way in which the work has taken on this new relevance in light of COVID in, a, in a sort of a different space. And we were struck by the number of comments and just even throughout our suite of events. So we started our events last year and have been um, scheduling them every so often virtually to sort of keep the um, reminder of this work and its um, resonance present in our own community as well. So um, thank you, Daniel, for your comments. Yeah, I just um, want to pipe in there too, if I can, Julie, um, yeah. about, uh, you know, we kind of talked about, uh, Peter talked about how, you know, we have made a lot of progress um, in institutions, but they still are pretty heavy rocks that are hard to move. Um, and especially from Joshua's point of view that, that the institution still has a lot of work to do, whether it's a university or a contemporary art institution. Um, and that might call into question whether the viral strategy of Felix was uh, effective, but I think uh, at least so far, and I think in all these quotes, we're hearing that the, the piece and, and maybe, and Joshua, you can correct me here, but uh, that Felix intended for this piece to be adaptive to, to changing circumstances uh, even if it maybe not lived up to its full promise, um, but it seems like it it does that. It it, it allows the, the piece is allowed to change enough that it it still connects with people on a very uh, basic level. And Nico talked about this in his presentation that not knowing anything about these levels of of discourse and criticism about the institution, there's still a very personal, direct uh, experience with taking that piece of candy, almost like a communion that a lot of people still identify with even today. Yeah, I, I would like, um, and one of the things I kind of wanted to say in the remarks that I didn't because I was trying to keep them short, right, is that I, I wanted to sort of attenuate maybe my critique of the strategy versus the critique of the work itself, right? Um, the part of what I was putting pressure on, it, you know, and, and one of the, I think, tragedies of his loss um, is that he made work that was constantly shifting and meant to be adapted in context to the context um, that it worked in. So the work is designed to actually adapt. And an example that I can give is that, um, you know, his portraits were um, these kinds of spatial experiences where you walk into a room and you see a list of dates and events, um, usually wrapping the sort of top of the room. Um, and he made a self-portrait to that effect at the Art Institute. They have um, a portrait of the Art Institute. And when you go to see it, it's up right now, or at least it, I haven't been there in a year, but um, uh, you'll see uh, references of things that happened since uh, he died, right? So one of them is, it says Barack Obama Millennium Park 2000, or Millennium Park 2008, which is referencing Obama's speech in 2008. Um, so the work itself was updating for the times, but because he passed in 1996, we've sort of frozen him in that moment, which means even some of the strategies that he carried out have been frozen in that moment. Like, I wonder whether the diacritical marks would have remained out of publications at this point or not, right? Um, so some of the pressure I was trying to put uh, on him is more on the strategy itself. And I wonder if even now, if he were still here, I don't even know how old he would be, right? But I think he would probably be in his fifties or so. Um, if we were to ask him, how did that strategy of infiltration work out? He might feel a little bit wearied. I, I guess I wanna believe he might feel a little bit wearied like myself, where it was like, you know, how it started versus how it ended were two very different things that one can enter into um, a practice um, uh, deploying a strategy of infiltration and that the work might do extraordinary work as as um, 
like Untitled LA does, um, but that it might not have actually been transforming the institutions that he was entering in, maybe the work that it was doing was something else, right? I think one of the things that is really carried for forward in Felix's worth is that it has created space for community that doesn't always feel like it has space, right? For queers who don't necessarily feel like we have a space to put all of the loss that structures our lives, whether it was lost during the AIDS crisis um, or even the loss of the generation um, in the AIDS crisis that might have mentored and raised up the next generation that came up. And his work has really created for sites of intergenerational relation and care. And even just like, I live with my two partners, they are the loves of my life. And in no small part, I learned how to love them through Felix's work, right? So I think the success of the work might not rest in the strategy. Like my critique of the strategy is not to say that the work itself isn't working. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Julie, I'll hand it back over to you. We've got some questions in the Q&A we're going to get to here in a little bit, but I want to get to some of the more quotes that Julie has here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that comment, uh, Joshua. I appreciated that. Um, Michael, Amy, so you're up next. So um, we'll pop your quote into the chat there, um, and you're welcome to expand on that or build off of um, comments that you heard this evening from Joshua or otherwise. First. Yeah, I'll just uh, read what I what I wrote about what, three weeks ago. Uh, I I think I've seen the piece several times in New York City in different iterations. So, um, Untitled L.A. remains pertinent because it is work which remains formally and conceptually in flux. It contracts and expands upon the floor as visitors remove identical elements from it and attendants add new ones to its configuration. The latter changes over time as well as from place to place while the shifting whole takes on the meanings its surroundings and audience project onto it. This work's shimmering green suggests young foliage reflected by water and thus life and thus hope, all of which are under siege today with the warming of our planet and rising social and political turmoil worldwide. Fittingly, Untitled LA also evokes shattered glass, thereby highlighting fragility, fracture, and ephemerality. However, what compels is the kindness of this work. Touch me, take me, place me in your mouth, suck upon me, until I am gone. It is about the gift of life and life taken away. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you very much for that. It's um, interesting you mentioned the broken glass because there was a student in the space today who, who also said that she thought it was broken glass when she first looked at it, um, which I thought was a really interesting contrast between that, that kindness you talk of, Michael, um, an invitation to partake in it versus a kind of uh, more threatening substance. Yeah, and I was struck, Michael, by the way, you picked up on the, the natural elements, um, this idea of changing over time, but also water and life and the natural elements, which um, I'm not sure about everyone, but I crave so much, particularly during COVID when we feel so closed in, um, not only literally, but um, figuratively as well. Um, I teach on campus, you know, two days a week with the students so I can be with students, but feel still quite restrained and the awkwardness and the way in which you can't really, you know, tap a student on the shoulder to say, good job. You, know, you, know, you really can't engage in that sense of touch. And so I was really struck about um, your elements uh, of your piece that spoke to nature and this idea of touch as well. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm interested because it's a work that really can take you in all kinds of different directions. Uh, it, it is basically so simple and, you know, it's, it's something that's also, you can't quite pin it down because it's, it's a work that involves color and light. And of course, uh, you know, is, is it a work of sculpture? Is it, you know, it involves, it involves people, uh, you know, the, the people who come into the gallery and then of course the people who have to nurse the work, tend to the work, uh, make sure it stays alive, uh, that it doesn't, you know, disappear within a, within a matter of hours. Um, 
So it's, um, you know, I, I wish I'd had more space to, uh, to write about it. Uh, 150 words was, uh, was a good challenge. But I managed to do it. Uh, I managed to do it rather quickly, which I think says that I was, that was a good writing day for me. And it was also uh, a work that, uh, you know, provoked me in all the good ways. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So next we're going to hear from um, Ebony, uh, Ebony Jones Stewart. So let's um, bring her to the floor. All right. Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. So I'll start off with saying that even being asked to share about one of my favorite artists was just like such a dream and a treat. And, you know, thank you, John and Julie for this. Um, I guess why Felix Gonzalez Torres is so important to me is because of him sharing his loss and the idea of loss and illness so openly with the world and in in the like art historical gallery art world museum sphere and so in this COVID landscape, we also have loss and illness and death and a lot of really hard feelings to cope with. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of take all of our, our baggage or our thoughts and we can take them to this space and we can touch something in a space that normally we're not allowed to touch. I mean, the number one rule of, you know, museum club is don't touch the art and to be able to touch, taste, feel, um, and participate in his, his loss and maybe think about some of our own losses and, but also almost have this little bit of, of hope, this, this sweetness, uh, not all candy is created equal. And I mean, there could be a, a chance to have like really crappy candy, but this, like this candy in like Untitled LA is like, sweet and and fruity and it's 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 pleasant and so that's a, a sweet spot in in the midst of all that is last year and this year mm -hmm. and thinking about the the sweet spot also the way in which um you know does the sweetness linger does it is it like a jolly rancher where it's persistent taste throughout and it's you know the first uh taste of grape still tastes like grape or green apple in this case or is it one that kind of dissipates over time um uh, thank you ebony very much for sharing your comments with us appreciate it um and let me ask you a side note uh ebony in terms of your role as curator of interpreter interpretive resources um, does that make you think of this piece maybe um, differently than your art historical background and your rooting in art history? Since you have a public sure. role. Right, right. And so that's, you know, from my art historical background, I loved saying, you know, F what the white cube says, you know, touch, taste, do all of these things. And then um, now kind of being in this, this role that really incorporates archives and being front facing and talking to people, even uh, sharing this event with people and them not even knowing who Felix Gonzalez Torres was and being able to share that was really, really sweet because everybody should know about him. Thank you, Ebony, very much. Um, so uh, our, our final person to share out um, who's joining us tonight is Nico Vicario. So I'll hand the mic over to him for just a moment. Um, and then we'll turn to some of our questions that are in the um, question and answer. So um, Nico was with us, what month was that, John? I have it written down. So it, it, it was, was November. It was November, yeah, Nico, thank you. It was in November. So Nico kicked us off as John mentioned earlier. And so thank you, Nico, for um, launching us on this journey with Felix Gonzalez Torres um, that we've been able to enjoy for three months, a uh, little bit over that actually. Um, so thank you for that. And we thought we would um, offer you some time to kind of share your perspective on um, Felix Gonzalez Torres and the work, the resonance, and feel free to um, comment on anything that Joshua has raised as well. Okay, uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't prepare anything, but it's really nice to um, attend the event 
uh, today, um, and also to have heard um, from the speakers of, at the second event. Um, I mean, fascinating. I think that for me, it's really the richness, the kind of inexhaustibility of the work that some of the other um, people sharing today have, have touched upon that um, there, there's a richness that the artist himself spoke about, um, right? That he wasn't interested in controlling the meaning, the circulation of meaning, um, that the, the work would be rewarded by very diverse um, interpretations and, and responses. So I think this event today is, is a testament to that. So I appreciate um, the openness of, of this platform for um, different people to engage and, and contribute. Um, yeah, and the, and the whole experience, I'm so grateful for having been um, invited to reflect and learn more and kind of dig deeper into uh, the artist's work. When I uh, gave my talk in November, it's, it's really um, led me to want to um, bring uh, maybe a comparable work to Amherst College where I teach and, and kind of continue the conversation here. So I'm really grateful to be um, part of the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. Um, thank you, Nico. And I'm just putting a link in the chat of the City Art Spaces website. So John had mentioned earlier that um, the earlier presentations are online and you can view them. So since we've just um, heard from Nico, wanted to make sure you had the context for that in case you've not seen them um, or um, just in case you wanted to go back and look at them. So the events were from November and December. So Nico was at the November event and then in December on World AIDS Day, Day Without Art, um, we had a, dis a discussion with um, several members of our community and, and also invited Jackson um, Davidow to come and um, share his perspectives on FGT as well. So I think we'll turn over to some of the question and answers if that's okay with everyone. And I'll just kind of take them in order. Um, so Drew uh, Slickmeyer is asking a question. Joshua, how do you deal with working for an organization or university that doesn't share your views towards inclusion and diversity? And do you consider yourself viral in a way? I mean, I think, um, I think part of the, um, no, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I consider myself viral in any way now. I think, you know, part of what I, I've been trying to grapple with is that, that um, when I first encountered Felix's work, um, I'm, you know, I grew up in Colorado and I moved to New York City uh, in 1999 for college. And uh, one of the first things I saw as I was walking through Soho was this billboard um, with these two sort of a bed with these two imprints in it. And I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was really beautiful and it was sad. And I was this, you know, sad little gay boy <laughs> straight off the plains of Colorado. And it just, I thought it was beautiful. And yeah. um, I didn't know anything about art, but it seduced me. And um, a few, about two years later, I was living in a studio in Queens, going back and forth to classes in Manhattan. Um, and that same billboard showed up um, in, a, um, uh, in a train yard that the train would go by every day. And I became so sort of obsessed with that billboard, which at that point I thought was haunting me, um, that I just started looking for it. And lo and behold, one day I was looking through an art book and there it was. And that sort of started this love affair with Felix. And part of what seduced me was um, that the work could be so beautiful and that, you know, without knowing anything about him, I could see these two empty beds and knew that it was a story that, that was telling a story that, that in 1998 wasn't being told um, for queer kids. Um, I knew I was entering into queerness um, uh, at a moment when so many had just died because of the first wave of the pandemic. And the more that I learned about Felix, the more that I found myself mourning as a 19, 20, 21 year old, that this person had somehow figured out how to you know, break into these institutions that, that were hostile um, uh, and to, to create work that as all of the speakers tonight have been noting was so profoundly effective and affecting, right? Um, and so I was really attached to what he articulated as the viral strategy. And I think I probably overinvested in that as my own kind of professional strategy, right? Like if you can get in the door and you could sort of trick your way in, then you can try to push um, uh, for more change. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes a lot of sense for a 19, 20, 21 year old who hasn't yet had a job to sort of imagine like when I, once I get a job working for the man, I'm gonna be like the virus on the inside that messes it up, right? Um, 
And, you know, I went through grad school, I got my PhD. I was very lucky to get a job as a professor. Um, and I thought to myself, like, yes, I've done it. I have avoided corporate work. And then the first thing that anybody who becomes a professor realizes within like the first month of the job is you're like, I thought it was a vocation. I thought I was like, I thought this was some medieval shit where we were going to like put on robes and like have ideas. And you realize like, oh, I have a corporate job. Um, I work at a corporation, right? Um, and one of the ways that that became really palpable for me over the last 10 years has just been watching, um, you know, I am lucky to teach in a department that is majority uh, faculty of color as well as majority um, graduate students of color. Um, and there are just some beautiful, wonderful things about the things that we're able to do in that space. But it, it even in a space um, like that, you know, the students are often drowning. The students often come to this institution that is majority white, that is very affluent, and they um, uh, experience anything from gaslighting to just outright abuse by the institution. Um, and then I sit on hiring committees where I watch and award committees and all sorts of, you know, the professional service that one does in one job. And I watch folks bend over backwards to not hire can like really qualified candidates of color. Um, just like, like, astounding the things that will come out of people's mouths to block a candidate for no reason other than that they're not the mediocre white person that we could also choose. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think over the years as I've continued to love, really love Felix's work, I think what I've realized is that what seemed to be appealing to me at the time was this sort of viral strategy, was, was maybe more of a kind of youthful hope for how one could, um, make one's peace with one's place inside of an institution. Um, but the thing that's extraordinary about Felix's work um, is that it didn't actually, the viral strategy didn't have to pay off for all of the things that everybody is mapping out here to, to, to work, right? And I think an example of that would be um, the piece at hand that we're talking about, Untitled LA. Um, uh, so, you know, he didn't title his pieces, he would leave them untitled, but like any good, um, I, I call this like gay Virgo control freak behavior, which I'm a gay Virgo. Um, uh, he put these parenthetical references. So he didn't title the piece, but he gave you something that was maybe kind of a title, but not the title, right? Um, and this particular title, LA, seems kind of oblique. We have also, we could have all sorts of associations with it, just including the fact that like, you know, my family's in LA and I live in Chicago and it is very warm right now. <laughs> and, um, you know, living out the pandemic at a distance of them has been hard. I lost both my grandparents in the last couple of months. But LA just seems like a space where there is life and light and air, right? So there's that association. But I also just know from my research in, in Felix's work that um, he fell in love with this guy, Ross Laycock at a bar uh, in Toronto, boy bar. Um, and um, because of immigration rules, they were never really allowed to live in the same place because uh, Ross was a Canadian citizen and Felix was, um, um, and I'm, uh, I believe he actually became an American citizen. He was certainly um, in the United States. And one of the only times they were able to live in the same place was in Los Angeles for about six months. But they got to Los Angeles and um, Ross's um, AIDS had advanced to such a degree that in Felix's writings at the time, what he narrates is watching Ross slipping away from him during that time. Um, so they finally got to live in the same place and he witnessed the end of his partner. And um, there's something so totally extraordinary about the simple gesture of just this piece, which we've been talking about taking the candy and eating it, right? But what, what we may also be seeing is a reference to um, the, um, not only the wasting of Ross and the loss of Ross, but also the way that we participate in that. We take the candy, we chew it up, we eat it, we consume it, we get pleasure out of it, right? And we watch this body waste away. Now that's an extra inc incredible move to make. And it has nothing to do with infiltrating the dominant society other than to say our love story might have mattered and meant something, right? Um, uh, so I guess the answer to that question would be how I feel about it is that I have maybe moved away from romanticizing the notion of infiltration and transforming the system from the inside out, which is really kind of what he was saying. <laughs> um, and instead understood that there can be a wide range of strategies that we have at hand to make real interventions in the world um, that could tell an 18 year old kid that didn't believe it would be possible to find love, um, that it is possible and that there are ways to do it and could also prepare that kid for the fact that that love might also be devalued and might even be lost. Right, that's an um, that's an extraordinary thing, um, but that it doesn't have to be the kind of um, viral strategy. So how I feel is uh, 
like I have a more sober relationship to my job. I recognize it as a job. Um, uh, I don't see it as kind of guerrilla practice as I think Felix would want to have wanted us to see it as. Um, but I still recognize the conditions of possibility for making real interventions as he was able to do in and through his work. I hope that makes sense. And it was kind of a long rambling response. But... That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. So, so um, next up is Terry's question and um, I'll pop it in the chat as well. But Terry's asking, um, your presentation reminds me of the AIDS quilt and the ashes of loved ones who died from HIV released at the Capitol. Forgive me, I forget the date. There was debate on which was more effective in infiltrating the white politicians to gain attention and help. So the AIDS quilt and the um, ashes of loved ones. So if you wanted to respond to that, Joshua. Maybe I wouldn't use the word infiltration in part because I've been um, punching it so hard tonight, um, right? But I, but what does the, both of those interventions um, and Felix's work um, strike me uh, as, as demonstrating the actual power that aesthetic practice can have to intervene in the sphere, right? Uh, in the public sphere. Um, and um, the, the AIDS quilt um, was a kind of extraordinary gesture, not only because it took um, a collective experience of grief that the nation officially refused to acknowledge and it laid it out, right, um, uh, on the National Mall where Congress and the White House could not avoid it. Um, you know, I think President Bush, um, uh, who, you know, of course had been part of the disastrous Reagan administration's response um, to the HIV crisis, um, himself had to visit it and perform a sort of gesture of mourning, right? And, and there is something so extraordinary about taking the aesthetic literally to the seat of power um, um, and, and saying, here, live with the loss right, as it's been materialized in this way. I um, mean, in a very different way um, at the protest where folks were throwing ashes um, onto the White House, in some ways, you know, I don't think the White House cared so much about that, right? I, I think the White House was pretty callous and continues to be pretty callous to the loss of US life. Um, that act as a performance, um, as an act of activism where it was profoundly effective or where I've seen it be really profoundly effective, weirdly as like years later, as people have watched that footage, that documentary footage and seen that, and and uh, that that has really galvanized and mobilized people in a way where it, um, I think can produce a will towards action. So I I would suggest maybe that some of the power of, of Felix's interventions, um, as well as the two interventions that were just uh, named the AIDS quote, and the activist intervention when, when ashes were thrown onto the White House lawn um, were powerful less as because they were infiltrative, but more because like any kind of aesthetic act or performance, they happened out in the, in the public and they reached out to touch people, right? Um, uh, whether it was sort of using the, the staging of the National Mall as a way to make that intervention um, or just the power of the gesture of coming to a place that says, you do not care about my, uh, my dead and my unmourned, so I will deliver them to you here, right? Um, um, and that's less about infiltration. It's more about reaching out and touching in a kind of way, in an open way. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. I just wanted to add to that Peter um, Gabeck, uh, who shared earlier with us, he had uh, put also in the Q&A related to the AIDS quilt, um, and I'll just read it, but we popped it in the chat. On the news last night, there was a piece on the young, <clears throat> daughter of one of the women who founded the AIDS quilt project and the daughter is now making COVID-19 remembrance qu quilts in the same manner. So wondered if you had any thoughts and that's really open to anyone. So if you just, um, if anyone would like to share, um, I'm trying to think how they would do that, but I can call on folks, I guess. Um, so Joshua, do you have any thoughts on sort of like that parallel, this sort of this practice of making and displaying um, quilt handiwork textiles in, in these manners? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that um, I've learned a lot from um, um, uh, feminist art historians, um, people like uh, Jean Vaccaro and Julia Bryan Wilson, mm -hmm. um, is about the sort of feminized nature of, of um, uh, textile labor, right? That it's often been the domain of um, uh, feminized labor, laborers, um, and has been devalued as such, while it has also played a central role in the stitching together and maintaining of the domestic space, right? Um, and, and so I've always appreciated um, the AIDS quilt um, 
for sort of um, taking a devalued domain of labor um, and transforming it into a really kind of powerful um, statement of grief, mourning, and rage. Um, and and those kinds of everyday small gestures, um, uh, we might even call them gestures of refusal. Um, there's my dog and one of my partners. Um, uh, those small everyday gestures can be just sort of remarkably powerful in helping us to absorb the unthinkability of the, the like degree of grief and loss that we're living through. So just as like a very simple example, I live in Chicago in the uptown neighborhood and about one block north of me, uh, there's a house and the people in the house just put out a poster um, with fabric and invited people to tie strips of fabric to the fence um, um, to mark their lost loved ones from COVID. Um, and over the last year, I've watched that fence just grow immensely with these tiny pieces of fabric that people stop and tear um, and, and line, into, um, line into that house. And in some ways, walking by that house and that little gesture of this kind of tactile, you know, this is, is a different kind of um, work of working with, um, um, of working with fabric, but like that that little gesture has to me been probably been the most effective and moving form of memorializing the ongoing wave of loss that we are living through far more than looking at the graph every morning in the Chicago Tribune or the New York Times that shows me the number of deaths, far more than watching sort of CNN do its roundup of two or three people that they've chosen to um, memorialize, right? But that there is just something about the everyday labor of using your hand to mark a loss and then putting that material in front of other people that is actually like profoundly effective and will continue to be profoundly effective. And there's a reason that people have used that kind of labor for years to mark loss and mark time. So I don't know if that's, that's sort of a response. Oh, I think it's a beautiful response and just the, the entire practice of actually the stitch work, but then also the evenness of, um, I'm a daughter of a quilter. My mom for a very long time and the evenness of that stitch work and the, the therapeutic um, nature of it and, and the capacity that the, the mere thread and the cloth bring together and, yeah. you know, and how it changes over time too. Um, yeah. The end of that, her towards the end of her quilting um, years the stitches weren't even, and there was always this apology of hmm. it didn't actually resonate in the same way. And it's like, oh, please, like it, it, it has your touch embedded. Yeah. Just like the candies, every candy, I would presume John, but correct me if I'm wrong, every candy nearly has John's touch on it. And he played no role in their making, but he played a role in their installation. So that, that labor, the unseen labor that we just take for granted um, with stitches, with candy spills, totally. Yeah. And I, I would just, I would add on, like, just on the very end of that, um, the amount of care that it takes, right, in stitching and the intention and the slowing down of time to do it. Um, one of the doctoral students in our program, Cordelia Rezo, um, is working on a project in part about um, uh, a group of activists in um, Mexico um, who have engaged in stitch work to memorialize the disappeared. Right. And what it means to just take space in public space and then take the time to slowly stitch the name of someone. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then even giving that over to the mother of that person or the mother herself sitting there and stitching the name of her son who is no longer with her. Right. The care that it takes um, it seems to me to be an extraordinary gesture in a time when we it's hard for us to find care for each other or for our lost. So thank you for that, Joshua. And thank you, Peter, for the uh, question slash comment. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is encourage other folks to include a question in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna pop in the chat a couple of comments um, from folks who are not joining us tonight. And for context, um, the first three uh, are going to be from those who shared the stage earlier. Um, they were with us on December 1st. So we have um, Evelyn Bailey, who is the Gay Alliance archivist, and she's the Rochester LGBTQ historian. And her commentary, which Courtney has um, provided for us, um, connects uh, again with the COVID-19 and the sense of the, the candy um, and the connection to life and diminishment. Um, next up in the chat will be uh, Tamar Carroll, a colleague of mine in the Department of History at RIT. And she um, connected the work again to the COVID-19 and making sense of this incalculable loss 
and the so many minds and sort of the way in which, as Joshua was just mentioning, as opposed to checking your uh, daily counts of the, of the COVID loss, sort of thinking of it and grappling uh, with it in terms of the number of candies um, on display perhaps. Um, and then third is Jackson Davidow, who I mentioned earlier as well. And he's an independent scholar um, based in Boston. And um, I'll also grab uh, here uh, from the, for the chat, a piece that he wrote recently on, at the Boston Review and I'll pop it in. It's on museums and mourning in the age of COVID, um, which came out when uh, the day that Jackson was with us, um, which was really um, quite poignant. And he also talks about the COVID pandemic and his sense also too of having this sense of loss of not being able to experience the work firsthand because um, we were doing this of course in the virtual format. Um, and then I thought we could, so you have those quotes and comments from our colleagues in the chat, they're listed before you. And then the last one is the URL to Jackson's piece in the Boston Review that I mentioned. And then um, my thought was, it's about 7.20. We could see if there are any other questions that folks have. And we also have two other comments or quotes to share. So I'll just kind of pause for a moment and let that settle. Um, Anna, or Anna Wager, um, she, uh, offered a commentary for us that you see in the chat. And she is a visual arts curator at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, which is nearby in Geneva, New York. And um, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with Anna a number of times And the most recent collaboration that we had was for a show that I co-curated with my colleague, um, Hinda Mandel called Crafting Democracy, Fiber Arts and Activism. And the show was um, here in Rochester and then traveled and then it ended um, its run at Hobart and William Smith. And um, Anna's uh, background, uh, and I bring that up because it's relevant because a lot of her um, art historical research actually deals with uh, labor practices and um, women's work of the 19th century. So I brought that up as a point of comparison. Um, so she comments on the 400,000 COVID deaths um, when, at the time when she visited uh, Untitled LA. And I wanted to sort of remark on that last little um, bit. Um, first of all, she talks about it being sunny in Rochester and those of us in Rochester know that that's an anomaly. Um, but she also um, mentions very specifically, um, it was sunny for the first time in what felt like weeks. I slipped the green apple candy under my mask while standing on the sidewalk and felt the far below freezing wind hit my face while the sun shone off the snow and a car horn blare in the street and the sharpness of the candy combined into a cutting mixture of sadness and joy. So the sense of these juxtapositions and how they play out in our experience with the work and then the telescoping of previous experiences as we've sort of heard mentioned um, by some of our people who have shared with us tonight and also with Joshua's commentary. Um, John, I'll turn things back over to you unless you're ready for us to um, close down with Rebecca. Yeah, I think uh, uh, another another contributor who um, couldn't make it uh, tonight, but contributed a comment is Rebecca Rafferty, who's the life editor at our local city city newspaper, uh, and uh, her quote brought up a, a lot of uh, different things, but specifically having to do with how the the piece is labeled uh, as as material. You know, typically you'll have a label and it'll say the artist's name, the title of the piece and then the material uh, and um, the material listed as these sort of individually wrapped candies wrapped in cellophane, endless supply. And the, the, the attitude behind that is that, um, you know, in, in my case as a curator or whoever is hosting these pieces, and it's one of the reasons these pieces are so amazing to kind of work with is because you can um, sort of customize the appearance of it in the space. And then of course, over time, especially if you're in a museum with a lot of traffic, over time that piece um, uh, depletes. And as, you know, as a curator, if you look on the Felix Gonzalez Torres website or the foundation's website, you'll see how different curators uh, treat this differently. So in, in some cases, uh, they'll just allow it to deplete. So it, it starts out as very neat and, and unified and organized. And then by the end of the exhibition, it's complete mess. Um, other curators, 
you know, will replenish the, the candy and repair it and put it back to its original state. Um, and in our case, um, and we talked about this a little bit with Nico in his first um, talk was that in, in the kind of pandemic situation, um, you know, not only did you have this kind of fear of interacting and touching things, but, you know, foot traffic was a lot lower and, and the experience of the piece became a lot more remote. And so uh, this idea of the endless supply of the thing being endless um, brought up some interesting ideas about, um, and what Rebecca says is we can't really comprehend what that means, what, what the endless supply is. You can see her uh, quote here. Uh, she says, alas, real humans aren't always equipped with the fantastical concept of an endless supply of what's missing to replace what is missing. Uh, make the, making the self whole is a real life, lifelong pursuit and is ideally tackled with the help of a strong community or failing that, a truly benevolent, not negligent structure of authorities. Uh, and so uh, it feels like the, the endless supply is also kind of related to this sort of uh, endless interpretations and this endless change that the piece is constantly exposed to. And I see we have um, another question in the um, Q and A, and this one comes from Drew. And Drew is asking, what role and responsibilities do you think RIT takes on when it shows a work like Untitled LA by an artist like FGT? So I, I think John and I could probably comment on that, but Joshua, I'd be interested in what, what you think in terms of what role an institution in general. So we'll, we'll, John and I can speak to the RIT-ness of it, but, but I'd like to also hear from you in terms of your perspective on that. Um, so I'm gonna pop the question in the chat just so you have reference to it. But um, I, John, do you wanna speak first about the role and responsibility? Um, since I'm the interloper, I mean, it's your gallery space and I'm just an interloper slash collaborator. So I have thoughts and feelings, but. Well, I, I'll answer the same way. We kind of got this question too before about, um, you know, the, the responsibility. And I, I thought of it more as a privilege to be able to, to, to not only show this piece, but actually have a hand in, in shaping the way it was received by our audience. Um, and we were able to sort of use the, the architecture of the space. And, you know, the piece was originally designed to, to mirror the weight of a human being, but we chose to, to do it in a more geometric fashion. And over time, it hasn't changed that much because our, our foot traffic is lower and and uh, we just talked about that. But um, I think one of the reasons a piece like this is so special to host as a curator or a gallery director or museum director um, is that you get to share that responsibility. You get to share in the manifestation of the work and, and the way it changes or doesn't change over time. And that's different from so many other pieces that, that you might get a chance to, to show. And so I see it more as a, a really, a, almost a collaboration even after Felix's death. Um, that uh, that is a privilege to kind of be a part of. Yeah, Joshua, did you want to chime in before? Yeah, I mean, I in some ways, um, what I in some ways I can speak almost more to the question abstractly than to the specific piece, right? Like, um, um, one of the things I love about the way that RIT has responded to the piece and to the pandemic is to create like public format, you know, programming at, using Zoom as a way to actually like this program creating a form to actually talk about the work and like let it breathe and open up, um, I think is, is critically important. Um, I think more abstractly, you know, what responsibilities do institutions do when they're engaging with the work from communities that are often excluded from those institutions? It's, it's a really weighty question. And the way that I'll answer it is by shifting just briefly to a different work and a different example. Um, uh, many will be, some will be familiar with a, a influential work by Arthur Jaffa. Um, called Love is the Message, The Message is Death, um, which is a, a film piece um, that sort of engages with Black life and the question of um, uh, both violence and joy um, that structure Black life. Um, there are a number of sequences in the film that show scenes of police brutality or an intervention in relationship to Black people um, and violence against Black bodies. Um, and it's very popular in museums. Uh, one sees it being exhibited fairly regularly and museums are spaces that are pretty hostile to black people in general, right? So when it was being exhibited here at the MCA, I'm picking on the MCA a lot today, sorry, MCA. But uh, when it was being exhibited here at the MCA, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Miriam Petty, who's a, a scholar of black cinema, 
um, she and I went to see the work and we managed to get there right at the end of the day. And we were, um, you know, as I said, I'm mixed. Um, we were two of uh, the only black folk in the museum that weren't working the coat check um, and the front gate. And we got into the piece and it was seven minutes and um, we knew there were about three or four minutes left of the piece and we were asked to leave because the museum was closing. Um, and we knew there was like two minutes left. So we're like, okay, let's just like, we know they want us to get out. We know these people want to go home, but we, let's just get our like one minute in. And another docent came in who was very aggressive with us and was just, it was, it was pretty ugly. And it was really um, um, uh, violent for my friend um, who uh, is a black woman, darker skin. Um, both of us are used to the kind of hostility of the institution, but the blows tend to fall more towards femmes and folks with darker skin. And, and you know, she just sort of said, um, art imitating reality, like this is, you know, what's going on. And, and we left really upset, not quite sure what to do about it. I spoke with a friend who's a curator at the MCA later and, and told her the story. And she was like, oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. He's an ex-cop, um, the docent. And the thought that my friend and I had had is why if the museum was going to show this piece that in every way references black life, wouldn't there have been training for the team about what it means to do that? Um, would, why wasn't there engagement at the level of the community, right? Um, so what does it mean when any institution um, um, engages work from communities that have awkward to like negative and exploitative relationships with those institutions, I think the process always has to be thoughtful. And in a weird way, COVID has actually allowed people to really engage in thought online through forums like this, which are really, really powerful. And I think for all of us that work at places that can do presenting work, whether it's a university or, or an institution, um, as we engage with work that um, um, may cast light on the systems of exclusion and exploitation that structure places like universities and museums. I think we have to be deeply intentional and humble um, um, about that process. So something I really appreciated about the programming about this is that I feel like it has done, done that level of work. And I think um, it's always going to be an impossible task, but there are ways that it can go really, really wrong. And that MCA story that I just told you is a prime example of like how profoundly bad um, that it can go just cheaply because the very thing that, that the museum was intending to show happens in a form in the museum at the scene of the exhibition and all my friend and I thought to us had said to ourselves as we were leaving is like we're both tenured professors um, who have been trained to study this exact moment right but if we were just my mom who had come to see this show and this had happened she would never go back to the museum ever again that would just be it that would be it. And that's one of the reasons the black and brown, especially black and brown working class folk don't go to museums is that like, this is the way that folks are treated when one shows up to see a review of Carrie J. Marshall's work. Uh, so that's kind of a, that would be my sort of general you note, know, intention and care and also a kind of humility in relationship to the work. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Joshua. And, and I'm, I'm so sorry that you and your friend experienced that because, um, that that that's that was that's really I'm sorry. Um, I I appreciate what you said about uh, humility and also the sense um, in in my thinking through um, the responsibilities that institutions take on when showing the work is also about acknowledging that every exhibition um, and this is sort of my mantra um, every exhibition has the capacity to be a form of activism. And it's just however far that is pushed. Um, and I say that in a positive way. Um, I mentioned the Crafting Democracy show. My co-curator is very much a craftivist and I'm not, I'm a curator. Um, I'm not an activist and I'm not a craftivist, but I feel that every exhibition has that potential to be a form of activism and a platform for conversations. So there's always this sort of undergirding of education is what exhibitions are about. And that's what we teach um, for our students. And that's what we put into practice, but it's also about activism and thinking through how can we affect change? Is it in the label copy? Is it in the actual display of X, Y, or Z? Um, and, and what responsibility, honor, um, pleasure um, do we have in doing that? So, um, so I think I'll turn things back over to John. Yeah, and no, just um, 
I got a, a note from uh, Kelly, our visual note taker, and I'm looking at this uh, visual representation of our conversation, and I'm I'm uh, totally impressed and stunned that um, she was expressing her regret for not being able to fit more in, and I, I feel your pain because there's so much going on here, and I'm glad that you left it up because um, uh, it is something that you can sort of sit and absorb and kind of go through our conversation visually, and it's truly been. Uh, an incredible contribution to our conversation this evening. So I want to thank you, Kelly at Kingman Inc., uh, for sharing your talent with us here. I think uh, we all realize we could continue this conversation in a number of ways. Um, but uh, as we bring these sort of discussions to a close, I just want to thank everyone who's, who's contributed in their thoughts and their time and their efforts to this program as we've hosted this piece by Felix Gonzalez Torres. Uh, in partnership with with Art Bridges. So I just want to offer enormous thanks again to our guests this evening, uh, Joshua Chambers Letson and Kelly Kingman for sharing your insight and your creativity for this rich conversation. Um, my, co -host, my co host, Julie Decker, and of course, Art Bridges and the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation and to RIT for supporting this project. And I want to thank all of you for staying with us and tuning in. I hope you get a chance to visit City Art Space and see the show. It's up until February 21st, and you can experience um, the Felix and the Tours yourself. But uh, until then, thanks everybody so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.